So should we start slowly and then while we're waiting for people to join? So hello everyone. Um, thanks a lot for being here today and joining us. And a special thanks to Michael, uh, who found the time to be with us today, despite being a father recently so thanks a lot michael it's a great pleasure to have you here i guess michael doesn't need the special introduction but i will say a few words so he's a deep mind professor of ai at the university of oxford also head of graph learning research at twitter before he was a professor at imperial college london and he has visiting appointments across different universities including mit stanford and harvard uh, Michael received his PhD from Technion, Technion in 2007, and uh, he is a recipient of many awards, including the Royal uh, Society Wilson Research Merit Award, two Google Faculty Awards, uh, two Amazon Awards, five years grants, etc. etc. In addition to his academic career, Michael also has um, is a founder of uh, quite successful startups including um, Nova Fora and Vision that were acquired by Intel in 2012, Video Cities and Fabula AI that were acquired by Twitter in 2019. So uh, thanks a lot, Michael. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. And thank, thanks everyone for uh, the invitation and for participating. So um, I will talk today about um, craft neural networks. Uh, this is the topic that, that I've been working on in the past uh, several years, and more broadly geometric deep learning. But uh, today I would like to present somewhat maybe unusual uh, perspective, and uh, this is mainly based on some recent work that we've done at Twitter with collaborators from Imperial, Oxford, and, and a few other places. So let me start maybe with the beginning, and uh, here I quote. I don't know if you can see my slides. Do you actually? Uh, do you see the next slide? No, no we don't. Sorry, then uh, that's exactly. I see that the sharing is paused. Let me do it again. Sorry for that. I hope you can see it now. Can you? Not yet, but uh, it's trying to connect. No. Let me try to put it again. Nothing. No, we just have the black screen now that says that you started screen sharing, but... Yeah, I don't know why. This is weird. Because it was working before, so... You, you see anything or nothing at all? It's starting. It's the same. Do you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry for that. So, uh, yeah, so let me start with, um, basically with a, a little a little parenthesis. And uh, here I start with a quote from, from Herman Weil, who said that symmetry as wide or as narrow as you may define its meaning is one idea by which uh, uh, man through the ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. So this is from his book titled Symmetry from the 50s when he uh, uh, finished his career at uh, the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, indeed, he was one of the fundamental contributors to the, the modern formulation of mathematical physics, where uh, symmetry plays a crucial role. And here is another quote. This is from Philip Anderson, a Nobel-winning physicist, who said very briefly that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. And uh, if we trace symmetry back to the uh, to, to the role it plays in geometry. So geometry for uh, more than two thousand years was uh, to some extent boring. So it was Euclidean geometry, the only one that we knew. And the situation started rapidly changing in the nineteenth century with the emergence of different kinds of non-Euclidean geometries. So uh, 
all these zoo of different geometries was systematically classified by Felix Klein, who proposed to define geometries as the study of symmetries or invariants. So you describe the kind of transformations that an object can undergo uh, using the language of group theory, and then you see uh, basically uh, what is the hierarchy of these groups. And uh, this was really uh, influential. Uh, this uh, is known in mathematics as the Erlangen program. It had uh, immediate impact on geometry, obviously. So first, uh, these global geometries, such as projective geometry, then local geometries. Uh, the Riemannian geometry was uh, brought into this framework by Elie Cartan in the, the, about 50 years later. A category theory is a direct descendant from the Erlangen program. And in physics as well, as I mentioned, it had a profound impact, uh, including the Noether theorem, who proved that uh, physical systems uh, 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 have conservation laws that can be derived from symmetry. And uh, this is now uh, basically the description of uh, all physics that we know, maybe with the exception of gravity, the so-called standard model. So you can derive all the interactions between particles from first principles of symmetry. Now, what does it have to do with deep learning? We have, on the one hand, this uh, unhealthy situation where we have a lot of different models uh, that are, uh, work for different types of data, but few fundamental principles and uh, maybe in a little bit arrogant uh, framework that we like to compare, at least in its spirit, to the uh, Erlangen program we, uh, that we call geometric deep learning. We try to unify uh, the zoo of different architectures uh, from first principles of uh, symmetry, invariance and equivariance. So that was the subject of my um, uh, iClear uh, talk last year. I was criticized for this irreverent picture of the revolutionaries of machine learning and uh, also the subject of the of the book that we are currently writing and hopefully will be published with MIT Press uh, uh, this year. So just to recap what geometric deep learning is about, if you think of a very simple setting of um, supervised machine learning where you have the input and the output, uh, let's say probably of image classification, so uh, you are given uh, examples of uh, images of cats and dogs and you want to label them binary, right? Uh, uh, either as cat or as a dog. So this is essentially a function estimation problem. So you sample it on a few points and you try to, uh, to estimate what the values will be at points that we have not observed before. And this is a very well studied pro problem in approximation theory. Unfortunately, all the bounds that we have work in low dimensions, like in one, two, maybe three dimensions. Uh, on the other hand, machine learning problems uh, mostly work with very high dimensional data. Images are, uh, have thousands or maybe even millions of dimensions. So most of these bounds uh, become meaningless because of a phenomenon that is colloquially known as the curse of dimensionality. And the curse of dimensionality is always there in machine learning. People have always tried to deal with it. So geometric deep learning offers uh, a principled way uh, to try to deal with it. And uh, here the remedy comes from the structure that often underlies our data. So talking about images, images are not just high dimensional vectors. They have underlying grid structure. So more generally, we can talk about a domain uh, which has some geometric structure that is captured by its symmetry group. For example, uh, you can think of the domain of, uh, uh, let's say, a plane or a grid and the translation group that is associated with it. It can be anything that you define depending on the problem. It can be also rotations and reflections. The signals that live on the domain, so these are the images, on them the symmetry group acts through the group representation. So depending on the type of data, you might have different representations for the same group. So for example, if you have vectorial data, then uh, uh, this representation will look differently. So in a simple case, it will just be the shift operator, as, uh, uh, as we'll see in the uh, in, uh, immediate example. And finally, uh, the symmetry of the domain uh, influences the choice of the function that you apply on the signals through uh, invariance or equivariance. So you can design a function that will be unaffected by the action of the, of the group or will be affected in the same way. You can also complicate it more. So you can, for example, talk about the internal symmetry of the data. So in terms of physics, this is what is called the external versus internal symmetry, right? The symmetry of the space versus the symmetry of the field that describes the interaction. But let's not get into these details. So one uh, most prominent example are probably convolutional neural networks, where the, the domain is the plane or the two-dimensional grid. The, uh, the, the group representation is the shift operator, and the equivariant function is the good old very well-known convolution. And this is interesting because often uh, convolutional networks are described somehow vaguely inspired by the connectivity of the, of the visual cortex of the brain. 
with uh, local receptive fields and shared weights. So this is actually a mathematical way of deriving convolution from first principles. You can obtain it from this uh, requirement of uh, shift equivariance. Here's another example. So uh, another uh, increasingly more popular architecture, graph neural networks. In this case, we have uh, the domain is a graph. And uh, the, the special structural characteristic of the graph is that it doesn't have a canonical order of the nodes. So you need to deal with permutations. So the permutation group uh, acts on the, both the structure of the graph that is described as the adjacency matrix and the node features that are described as the feature matrix. And uh, in these architectures, the typical function that is computed uh, it has the form of message passing, which uh, computes uh, permutation equivariant representation of the data on the graph. Now, if we look at this, uh, this principle of symmetry as a, as a general blueprint, you can really apply it to a lot of different domains, such as grids, graphs, meshes, uh, you name it. The disturbing thing, though, is that for grids and for meshes, we do have underlying continuous objects, right? So the grid is a discretization of the plane, for example. A mesh is a discretization of a two-dimensional surface or a manifold. We don't have immediate continuous analogy for graphs. So I find it disturbing. We would like, first of all, to, to discuss something like this. Now, if we look at the core of what graph neural networks do, it's essentially some local permutation invariant aggregation. So you apply a shared function that I denote here by phi to the local neighborhood of a node. And I remind you that we don't have a canonical ordering of the neighbors, so this function must be invariant. If I apply it everywhere at every node in the graph, then the output that is produced this way, the node-wise features on the graph will be permutation equivariant. And the choice of this aggregator is crucially important. And it was shown in recent papers that if it is chosen as a, an injective function, then the, the graph neural network that results from it is equivalent to what is called the weiss frey lehmann graph isomorphism test. So it's a classical approach in graph theory that tries to determine whether two graphs are isomorphic, if they are the same up to the naming of their nodes. And the way that, that it proceeds, it basically tries to, uh, to, to classify structurally uh, uh, nodes based on their neighborhoods. So it's an iterative ref color refinement procedure. So it starts with all the nodes labeled in the same way with, let's say, blue color. And initially, it has two types of uh, neighborhoods, right? It has a blue node with two blue neighbors and blue node with three blue neighbors. So because of injectivity, these become distinct colors, now denoted by green and yellow. And now we have three types of neighborhoods. And I can proceed and so on and so on until the colors stop changing and I can stop the algorithm and output the distribution or the histogram of colors. And now if I give you another graph and I will get a different distribution, then I can say for sure that these graphs are not isomorphic. But if the distributions are the same, we actually don't know. So this is a necessary but insufficient condition. And in fact, we can find structurally different not isomorphic graphs that would be deemed equivalent by the vice versa element test. And uh, if we look at what it does, actually, uh, you can see that, that uh, it parses the neighborhood of a node into this kind of fruited tree. And you see that these trees and these uh, structurally different nodes would be uh, the same. So one remedy that has recently been proposed, and well, we had uh, two papers recently in ACML and Europe on this topic, is to go to uh, higher order objects, so to simplicial or cellular complexes, and do topological message passing. So in this case, we will have, for example, a, a triangle. So we'll lift the graph into this uh, cell complex, and uh, we can distinguish between these, uh, these structures by this message passing. Another maybe uh, uh, more uh, straightforward approach is to attach some additional features, what is called positional encoding, to the nodes of the graph. And this way, we can disambiguate these situations. So the simplest positional encoding would be, for example, random features. But of course, it's not a good idea because it doesn't generalize across different graphs. So something better could be, for example, structural encoding that we had uh, in a paper two years ago, uh, where we count primitive structures such as uh, triangles, uh, cliques, or cycles. And it actually uh, create, it has created an entire avenue of what we call uh, 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 subgraph uh, GNNs uh, that are related to the uh, interesting and deep topic of reconstruction conjectures in graph theory. But uh, let me not talk about it because I don't have time. So there are many other ways of doing positional encoding. So uh, graph Laplacian eigenvectors or uh, sinusoidal functions that are actually used in transformers in one-dimensional sequences. 
uh, and so on and so forth. But the point is that we don't have really a principled way of choosing the positional encoding, so we would like to have such way. And the final problem I would like to highlight with graph neural networks, which is not unique to graph neural networks, but it's probably uh, especially acute in, in these architectures, is the problem of over squashing. So if I have a problem that requires uh, long distance information, so I need to propagate information from the node, from the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors that are uh, several hops away. And I also have a graph that structurally has fast volume growth. In other words, the number of neighbors grows exponentially with the radius. Then I have the problem of over squashing in the sense that information doesn't flow efficiently. Basically, I, I need to squeeze a lot of data through a single vector. And uh, again, it has been seen in uh, sequence to sequence learning models, but in graph neural networks, it's especially bad. And empirically, it was shown that if you uh, separate, decouple the input graph from the computational graph, so if you do propagation of information on a different graph, you're allowed to rewire the graph or do some shortcuts, then this problem can be alleviated. And again, multiple methods have been proposed, but the bottom line is that we don't know how to rewire the graph uh, in a principled way. So what I would like to show today is uh, three recent papers. So one was uh, at uh, um, one was at uh, ICML, another one at NeurIPS, and the last one was just a few days ago accepted to iClear, where we try to, to take uh, approaches that are inspired by differential geometry and differential equations. And uh, if you uh, don't like to read the papers, we also have uh, popularly uh, discussed blog posts uh, that, that describe these, uh, these techniques. So let me start with the diffusion. Okay, so the what we call uh, uh, graph neural diffusion. So diffusion is probably one of the physical processes that have been studied extensively uh, for centuries. And one of the first attempts to describe diffusion mathematically is an anonymous paper published in the Transactions of the Royal Society in 1701. So the paper didn't have an author, it was written in Latin, but everybody somehow knew that it was uh, authored by Isaac Newton. He would become Sir Isaac four years afterwards. And they described the set of experiments and uh, uh, a rule that is now known as the Newton law of cooling, which tells that the temperature, or he actually used a different word, uh, word color in Latin, which literally means heat, even though in modern physics it has a completely different meaning, so the right term is temperature. So the temperature a hot body loses in a given time is proportional to the temperature difference between the object and the environment. So it's a kind of global rule that describes uh, heat uh, dissipation. It took more than a hundred years. Uh, another mathematician, this time French one, uh, Joseph Fourier, uh, described a differential version. So calculus already existed at that time. Uh, and that now bears his name. And he said that uh, heat flux resulting from thermal conduction is proportional to the magnitude of the temperature gradient and opposite to it inside. And we are missing one last bit to, to form the diffusion equation, and this is called uh, uh, often the uh, Fick's law of diffusion. So Adolf Fick was uh, actually he started his career as projector in Zurich. He was a chemist by, by formation, and uh, basically he introduced a conservation law: the temperature change in time equals to the heat flux through the volume. So putting these things together, this is the diffusion equation. So we have uh, a scalar field that describes some quantity, for example, temperature. Uh, the difference in these, uh, in these values create the heat flux that, as I said, is inversely proportional to the uh, gradient of the temperature. And the conservation condition tells us that no heat appears or disappears. So put together, this creates a partial differential equation with the difference on the temperature in time on the left hand side and the divergence of the gradient on the right hand side. And this equation might have uh, might take multiple forms. So in the simplest case, we have constant diffusivity. So the heat propagates equally at every point of the domain. And this is called homogeneous isotropic diffusion. In this case, we can actually take this constant C out of the divergence and we get divergence of the gradient, which is nothing else but the Laplacian operator. Now we can make a more interesting equation. So we can relate this equation to the minimization of the Dirichlet energy. So this uh, functional, uh, its gradient flow uh, is exactly the heat diffusion. And we can also uh, write a closed form expression for the diffusion. It's a Gaussian filter. So people that, that uh, are working in image processing will, of course, uh, know immediately the relation between diffusion and, and image filters. A more interesting version of the diffusion equation is where the uh, diffusivity is uh, uh, positionally dependent. So it's a scalar function depending on the position. 
So this is called non-homogeneous equation. And finally, we can also make it not only position, but also direction dependent. So it's a matrix valued function that scales the gradient. Now, the uh, non-homogeneous equation became very popular in uh, image processing because it allowed to perform denoising in a way that preserves edges. So the idea that was first pioneered by uh, Pietro Perona and Jitendra Malik, they incorrectly called it an isotropic diffusion, but the correct name is non-homogeneous isotropic diffusion, make the diffusivity proportional uh, uh, to uh, the inverse of the gradient norm. So the gradient in this case tells you whether you have discontinuity in an image and the diffusion will effectively stop when it uh, reaches an edge. So it will not mix pixels of different colors. And here you can see the effect. So in the middle, you see the standard homogeneous diffusion. So conversion with the Gaussian kernel of increasing size with time and non-homogeneous non-linear diffusion that preserves the edges. And we can clearly see the, the face of Sir Isaac uh, in this uh, uh, in this picture. So this has been uh, extremely popular in image processing. So the entire books were written about variational methods and the resulting uh, partial differential equations that you can derive from uh, Euler Lagrange equations. And it is a very beautiful and very appealing idea. So you say that you have an energy that models somehow the quality of ideal image that you want to obtain. Typically, it looks like something total variation. And you uh, get the, the, uh, an evolution equation, a gradient flow that minimizes this, uh, this functional. And it was wiped out completely by deep learning uh, methods in image processing because it is very hard to, hard, uh, to, to, to handcraft this uh, criterion of, of basically uh, the, the, the energy that you try to minimize. So what we'll try to do, we'll try to revisit some of these ideas while well, on non-Euclidean domains and using the tools of deep learning. So we will have uh, a modern take uh, reincarnation of uh, some of these uh, diffusion equations. So now we have everything that we, uh, in order to, to uh, understand diffusion on graphs, Basically, the, the key ingredients of the diffusion equation that we've seen before was the gradient and divergence operator. So here is how to define the one graph. Uh, this is completely straightforward. So uh, on the graph, we assume that we have node features. I denote them by x. So the gradient simply takes the difference between the endpoints of an edge, right? Nodes uh, i and j, and assigns them to the respective edge. So it's uh, an operator that takes a signal defined on the nodes and assigns uh, a, a new signal to the edges of the graph. Divergence does the opposite. So it takes a signal on the edges of the graph and averages it uh, or sums it up with maybe some weights uh, uh, and gives uh, a signal per, uh, per node, per every node of the graph. And not surprisingly, like in the continuous classical case, these operators are adjoint. So you can equip these spaces of uh, node and edge signals with respective inner products. So these are Hilbert spaces and uh, you can move around these operators under the respective inner products. And the Laplacian is the uh, divergence of the gradient. And if you write it explicitly, it has exactly this intuition that, that we first seen in uh, Newton's law of cooling. Basically, it's the difference between the value of the function at node i and the uh, mean of the function around the node. So that's exactly what the Laplacian is in the continuous case as well. You can derive it uh, uh, in this way. So now we have everything to write the diffusion on the graph. So here it is. It has exactly the same structure of the previous continuous diffusion equation. So we have the gradient. We have the diffusivity function, which will assume for convenience to be normalized to one. So it will be a stochastic matrix. And this is the divergence. So this is uh, a, a partial differential equation that is already discrete, so probably more correct term would be uh, a system of coupled uh, ODEs. The time here is continuous and it is nonlinear, so we need to solve it numerically. And the easiest way to solve it numerically using forward uh, explicit Euler scheme. So we just discretize time with a constant step that I denote by tau and replace the continuous uh, time derivative with forward difference. So if I write this formula in matrix form, uh, it looks like this, and I can call this matrix Q. So you can see that the update, the next iterate is obtained as a linear combination of the node features, but the combination coefficients themselves depend non-linearly on the features, right? So that's the diffusivity function A. And uh, what is important that the structure of this matrix Q has the graph adjacency structure, so it is local. Basically, every node is updated only from its neighbors. And we can show that this uh, schema is numerically stable for sufficiently small tau. 
So if I make small steps, then this will be uh, a good discretization. No disasters will happen. What you can also see that uh, if I assume this normalization, then this is nothing else but the graph attention network. So what uh, we call the diffusivity is also called attention in, uh, in the neural network literature. And uh, with tau equal to one, we get the popular architecture that was uh, first introduced by my colleague Petra Velichkovic from DeepMind. Now, we, of course, we don't need to stop here. We can discretize this uh, differential equation using other more sophisticated schemes. So here is one. This is semi-implicit or backward early discretization. So here we, we take a backward difference in time and we obtain an equation that depends uh, implicitly on the next state rate. So in order to get the next state rate, k plus one, we need to invert this matrix B or solve the, uh, uh, the linear system. And now you can see that if I write it as an iteration, then the matrix that produces the next state rate will not have any more a sparse structure of the graph. It will be typically dense. So it means that I take information from not only from my neighbors, but from other nodes. In other words, this is a kind of multi-hop filter. And of course, the, the, uh, the, what we gain from this scheme is that uh, this uh, scheme is unconditionally stable. So we can make uh, larger steps in time. Now, in classical numerical analysis, uh, this comes at the expense of accuracy. So you make uh, you still have a, a scheme that, that converges, but it will be less accurate. Uh, uh, what I claim that uh, this is important, but subtle, uh, uh, subtle difference that we are not uh, interested in solving a, a, an equation accurately. Because uh, this uh, diffusivity function will be learnable, and we can think of it as a way of parameterizing a space of solutions. So we have uh, a solution that is given by uh, this, with this physical system, by this diffusion equation. We have some nodes that we can turn, so that's the parametric diffusivity function that we'll be learning. And I want the solution at some time to, 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 to solve uh, some task in the best way. So I don't care about solving some uh, physical problem. So the physical problem is a way of parameterizing the solution. That's why I don't care about the, uh, the accuracy of the scheme. And of course, there are some uh, more uh, sophisticated techniques that can be used uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, numerical PDE theory, such as uh, multi-step, Runge-Kutta methods, uh, uh, adaptive step size, implicit explicit schemes, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we plug it together into a learning framework. So you can think of a graph neural network or a kind of a graph learning process. You start with initial features, you allow them to diffuse for a certain time with uh, uh, basically with solving iteratively this differential equation. And here in all the experiments that we did, we uh, uh, intentionally made the diffusivity independent on time. So it depends on time through the features, but not explicitly on time. So it's not a function of t, it's time of x of t. Okay. And uh, you can see already that basically different iterations of this solver correspond to layers of a graph neural network. So being independent on time means that we have shared parameters across layers. So this way we have way less parameters than uh, you would use otherwise. And you can ask, of course, what do we gain? Uh, first of all, we have new perspective on all problems. As we'll see that we can uh, also address things like overspooling and bottlenecks. We can also explain existing architectures such as uh, graph attention networks, but uh, we all can also potentially design new architectures. So some of the, the efficient solvers such as multi-step adaptive multi-grid methods do not have immediate uh, architectural implementations, at least uh, popular ones in uh, graph learning literature and probably uh, this field, this uh, way of looking at uh, graph learning problems will give uh, new uh, interesting architectures. There are, of course, theoretical guarantees, such as we can, we can analyze what happens, uh, what, what are the convergence properties, uh, whether the scheme is stable, uh, what, how it behaves in the limit. So that's the way we actually look at uh, over smoothing. And there are deeper links uh, to other fields that are less known in uh, graph neural networks literature, such as differential geometry and algebraic topology. I will say a few words about it later. So here's one example. So uh, you may know that in graph neural networks, one of the issues is how to build deep architectures. So uh, it appears to be difficult to, to stack multiple layers in graph neural networks. But most of the architectures behave like uh, low pass filters, so they tend to oversmooth. So in our case, we don't have layers. We have the diffusion time. That is a, a, the analogy of depth. And if we use a simple explicit scheme, then uh, there is this one-to-one -one relation between diffusion time and, uh, and the number of layers. 
But in adaptive schemes, you can have bigger steps, uh, so you have less layers, but you still diffuse for the same amount of time. And in implicit schemes, you can trade off between width and, and depth, right? So you could have bigger filters, multi hop filters. So here I can see how uh, we perform with uh, respect to depth. So most of traditional architectures, such as graph convolutional networks or graph attention networks, lose performance with uh, when they become deeper, like 32 layers is already performing very poorly. We don't observe anything like this with our scheme. And uh, this is a table, some standard benchmarks. We perform slightly better than, than uh, other uh, baselines. So without this, I'm afraid you cannot publish a paper in NeurIPS or ICML. So take it with a grain of salt, of course. One interesting observation, though, is uh, if you look at, let's say, a comparison of our framework with a graph attention network, so they get more or less the same performance, but we require about 20 times less parameters. And this is because we, uh, I remind you, we have a time independent diffusivity. So the attention weights in uh, using terminology of graph neural networks are shared across layers, which in our case are the iterations of the numerical solver. Now, so far we discretize the time. What about the space, right? So we are still uh, not there with uh, our initial desire to, to look at the graph as a continuous object, right? And again, if you take step, a step back and look at the classical uh, differential equations in the plane, for example, I can discretize the plane uh, as a grid and I can discretize numerical derivatives on the grid in different ways, right? So if I want to compute the Laplacian, for example, second order derivative, I can use uh, this kind of numerical stencil with four neighbors on top, bottom, right, and left. I can also rotate it by 45 degrees. I can take more distant neighbors. And because these operators are linear, I can uh, also combine them in any way, right? Any convex combination. So uh, any of these combinations will be a legitimate discretization of the derivatives. So the question is uh, how to do something similar for uh, graphs. And let me take you back again to uh, image processing. So that's where we started. So we looked at this nonlinear adaptive diffusion equation where the, the diffusivity function was adapted based on the content of the image, right? So we stopped the diffusion when it reached a discontinuity. Uh, so an alternative model is to look at uh, linear but non-Euclidean diffusion. So in this case, we consider the image as a manifold. So uh, it's a two-dimensional manifold or a surface that is embedded in some joint space where you have a combination of positional coordinates and feature coordinates. So just to make it concrete, if you have an RGB image, then you can think of it as a two-dimensional surface in R5. So you have the X, Y coordinates, uh, the positions of the pixels, and then you have the R, G, and B uh, uh, color channels, right? So on this manifold, we can pull back using the standard uh, differential geometric mechanism, uh, a metric tensor. And basically, it becomes a Riemannian manifold uh, on which we can uh, write an energy that is uh, a generalization of the Dirichlet energy that is called uh, in the Polyakov functional. You uh, encounter it in physics, in particular in string theory. And its minimization, the gradient flow is called the Beltrami flow, and it looks like a diffusion equation with uh, um, a non Euclidean Laplacian operator that is called the Laplace Beltrami operator that you can see here. So, Bel Beltrami was one of the early Italian differential geometers that actually proved that the non Euclidean hyperbolic geometry of Lobachevsky is self consistent, and that was really the first time that. Uh, a, a, a very concrete nail was put into the monopoly, in the coffin of the monopoly of, of uh, Euclidean geometry. Now, you can also see that you can write explicitly this metric, and it looks like very much like the Perona and Malik diffusion that we've seen before. So you can consider this as an edge indicator. And uh, you can consider the, the, the adaptive diffusion we've seen before as a special case of Beltrami. And you can see actually why it works like this, because now we are measuring the the distances, right? So the, the, the kernel runs on this surface and when you have an edge, you have a, lo a longer distance because the distance now measures both the distance between the pixels as well as their features. So we can immediately apply the same idea on graphs. So here we consider a graph with both feature and positional coordinates. I denote them by U and X. And the graph built Rami flow is a, a diffusion equation that evolves both. So it evolves both positional coordinates and the feature coordinates. So it's a little bit difficult to visualize, but I will try. So here is a graph embedded in some space. It actually doesn't need to be Euclidean. And for many graphs, uh, it is uh, advantageous to use, for example, hyperbolic embeddings because they better represent their uh, geometric structure. 
And uh, these are the feature coordinates, and we evolve both. So the evolution of the X component is the feature diffusion, and the evolution of Z, the, the positional component, is actually the graph rewiring. Because now uh, I don't have the graph anymore, or at least I don't need the graph anymore. If I embed my graph in some space, and it doesn't need to be an exact uh, embedding. So in most cases, I cannot isometrically embed graphs in some continuous space, but I still have some notion of neighbors. And I can just connect a, a node to its neighbors in the, in the embedding space. And when I diffuse, I will rewire and the neighbors might move. So I will connect them to, uh, 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 to new neighbors. So the graph will evolve as I, uh, evol uh, as I run this diffusion. And um, what we can show, and again, uh, allow me uh, to skip the details. So this is also slightly nuanced point. Uh, we don't have an immediate analogy of the pullback uh, mechanism on graphs. So we need to assume some structural constraints, but uh, bottom line, we can show that this graphical Ramy flow uh, minimizes some energy that, that structurally looks like the Polyakov functional in the continuous case. But now we have some better results in that direction as well. So this picture probably visualizes it way better than I, I could explain before. So this is the famous Cora graph, so it's a citation network. Every node represents a paper, and in the original graph, the links represent citations undirected. Uh, now, the colors here represent some low dimensional projection of the features of the nodes. Uh, and you can see that the colors change, so uh, the features are diffused and, and propagated on the graph. The positions of the nodes represent the positional encoding, again, a two dimensional projection. And you see that the graph is also rewired as we solve the equation. And here, the, the task is node wise classification. And you see that as we evolve the equation, because it is uh, uh, we try to find, to tune the, the, the parameters of this diffusion so it solves the classification task. You see a very clear separation between the colors that represent the features, right? So we can classify linearly uh, these, uh, 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 these clusters that we see in the graph. And the positional encoding becomes optimal for this task. And you can also see, maybe in perspective of other uh, uh, graph neural network architectures, that this is uh, a very broad generalization of a lot of methods that have been used before, including uh, graph attention networks, transformers, uh, dynamic graph CNNs, uh, spectral graph neural networks, and so on and so forth. And well, how can we deal without it? It also uh, outperforms some standard baselines by uh, a few fractions of percent. So this is what I had to say about diffusion. Let me say about the last problem that, that we, we had, uh, if you remember, the, the, the last point was uh, what can we say about graph rewiring? Now, if you look at this previous slide where we uh, evolved the graph, so this is a little bit a weird picture for classical signal processing, right? Where you have your domain fixed, for example, a one or two dimensional grid, and you only change the signal. So here, this is a kind of uh, weird situation when the ground moves under your feet, right? So in differential geometry, this is uh, a very uh, standard and uh, very well understood uh, uh, mental picture. So it is very common to evolve manifolds by modifying the metric by some evolution equation. And the most famous of these geometric flows is the Ricci flow. So uh, it looks like this. So G is the Riemannian metric, R is the Ricci curvature. So, and uh, structurally, it is analogous to the diffusion equation. So sometimes maybe with crossover simplification, it's called the diffusion of the metric. It behaves quite differently from the diffusion equation, for example, can create singularities, but uh, overall the structure is the same. So we have temporal derivative of the metric, uh, which uh, for two-dimensional manifolds is uh, just two-way two matrix. And on the right-hand side, we have the, the Ricci curvature tensor, which is second-order differential quantity similar to the Laplacian. And uh, Ricci flows, you might know, uh, have become very prominent in uh, theoretical mathematics. That uh, uh, is uh, a problem that, that was more than 100 years old, the so-called Poincaré conjecture, trying to classify uh, uh, topological, uh, what describes a topological equivalence of a sphere in multiple dimensions. And uh, basically what Ricci flow does, it takes, if you think of, uh, of a curve, a one-dimensional manifold, evolving it under curvature, in that case it's scalar curvature, uh, uh, it will collapse into something that becomes uh, looking like a circle and then into a point. So basically, Parker conjecture, roughly speaking, tells you that on a two-dimensional sphere, you can take a, a closed curve and collapse it into a point. 
and every cur curve uh, can be uh, can uh, uh, you can make into it uh, for every curve. Uh, on torus, for example, you cannot do it, right? So if you have a curve across the the, the donut, you cannot collapse it to a point. And the conjecture was that you can extend it to other dimensions. So it was proven in uh, in two dimensions, in four dimensions, but three dimensions for some reason appear to be difficult. So Richard Hamilton actually introduced the idea of Ricci flows as a, uh, an apparatus to prove the Poincaré conjecture, but the guy who proved it was Grigory Perelman. It was the breakthrough uh, 15 years ago when this famous conjecture, actually a more general result, what is called the, the geometrization uh, theorem now, uh, was, uh, was proven using Ricci flows. What does it have to do with graphs? I remind you that we wanted to look at uh, over squashing and bottlenecks. So over squashing is uh, this phenomenon of, of failure of message passing in graph neural networks to propagate information efficiently due to its structural characteristics. So the structural characteristic of the graph is uh, what is called the bottleneck. And it occurs in problems where we have long distance dependencies, where we need to propagate information from uh, many hops away. So typical example are uh, molecular graphs, where we might have uh, long chains and the property I try to predict depend on the features uh, of atoms on two different uh, ends of the molecule. And it occurs in graphs with exponential volume growth, where we have too many neighbors. It tends to deteriorate with depth, and it is empirically elevated by graph rewiring. So what we try to do in uh, this paper, and I will describe it only briefly, is to formally define over squashing in graphs related to uh, structure characteristics of the graphs that we uh, describe through geometric properties, namely uh, curvature. So we will generalize uh, the notion of Ricci curvature to graphs. And we propose a surgical process that rewires the graph that uh, it has some similarity to the Ricci flow. Okay. So that, that's, uh, that's the idea, and I will try to uh, cover it in less than, than 10 minutes. So first of all, the characterization of over-squashing. So essentially what we want to say that uh, over, over squashing is some form of lack of sensitivity of the output of the neural network to the input, right? So if we have a message passing type graph neural network, which has these uh, functions, I remind you, that these are the, the transformations, the messages, right? And the, the aggregation functions that we have in the graph neural network. Let's assume that there are Lipschitz continues. So the gradients are bounded by uh, some parameters alpha and beta, okay? Now, if I have a node i at which the, uh, some layer of the graph neural network outputs uh, a feature vector, I want to see how uh, it is influenced by the input uh, feature vector at some distant node s that is r distant from the, from the node i, right? So basically, I want to see how information flows from s to i. And I can write this uh, uh, expression. Basically, it is expressed by the Jacobian, right? The derivative of x i at the r plus first layer with respect to the feature uh, xs, and I can bound it. Well, the bound here depends, of course, on the Lipschitz constant of the functions, but also uh, on the structure of the graph through some power of the adjacency matrix, okay? So we can see some uh, pathological cases. For example, a, a tree is the worst case example where this, uh, 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 this over squashing is exponential. And you see that, that uh, the bottleneck, uh, the graph structure that is to blame is somewhere hidden here but it's not explicit. We don't really understand what to do with it. So in order to understand what is happening and make a, a more uh, nuanced analysis, we will uh, resort to the um, notion from differential geometry, the notion of Ricci curvature. So uh, informally, what Ricci curvature measures is what is called geodesic dispersion. So I take two nearby points, I denote them here by Q uh, and P, and I send geodesics uh, uh, along the same direction, so in parallel, uh, with the same velocity. And I see what happens. If they converge, then I look locally like a sphere. If they remain parallel, then I look like a plane. If they diverge, then this is what is called a hyperbolic surface, right? And in this case, we say that the curvature is positive, zero, or negative, okay? So we can do something like this in graphs as well. So we take nearby points, right? So these are nodes connected by an edge. And if I take edges that emanate from these uh, nodes, if they tend to form triangles, this is a kind of geodesic convergence, right? If they form rectangles, that it means roughly that they remain parallel. And if they become more distant and don't form any of these, uh, uh, what uh, uh, looks like a tree, then this is a negative curvature, right? So then they, they diverge. Uh, 
So uh, a clique is positively curved, the grid is uh, flat, and a tree is negatively curved. And we can define a, a notion of curvature. So there are actually existing constructions of uh, a, a analogs of Ricci curvature on graphs. Two most famous constructions are due to Foreman and uh, Olivier. Olivier curvature has been studied most in relation to uh, optimal transport because it's formulated in these terms. And uh, two fields medalists, Figali and uh, Villani, are famous for some works uh, on this topic. So we introduce our own version. So it's similar to Foreman, but it is uh, uh, called uh, a balanced uh, Foreman curvature. Uh, allow me to skip the details. Basically, we measure here the number of uh, triangles and rectangles around an edge. So the curvature is defined per edge of the graph. And uh, the bottom line, what is important, that uh, it corresponds to the intuition that we have in the continuous case. So clicks are positively curved, grids are flat, and trees are negatively curved. Okay. And we can show uh, that it uh, lower bounds the Olivier curvature. And if the graph is positively curved, meaning that we have a strictly positive upper bound on the curvature uh, for every edge, then the volume growth polynomial, which we recover the properties of uh, Euclidean uh, spaces and spheres. And we can also bound the Chigger constant or the spectral uh, gap of the graph. Uh, so the main result of the paper, and again, allow me to omit the details, is the following claim that basically if we have uh, negative, uh, negatively curved edges, so delta is some negative curvature, then we have many nodes for which this Jacobian that measures our over-squashing is small. So we have this problem of insensitivity, of uh, failure to propagate information that is controlled by, by, uh, by the curvature. And uh, basically, we can say that over-squashing is caused by negatively curved edges. Okay, so that's the main uh, point of the uh, of this uh, this theorem. Uh, so we study uh, local geometric properties of the graph expressed through, through uh, some form of uh, discrete Ricci curvature, and we come to the conclusion that what contributes to the uh, over-squashing in the form of this bound is uh, negatively curved edges. Now, this, of course, allows us to create a rewinding mechanism that basically seeks such edges and uh, surgically removes them or maybe replaces uh, them with some shortcuts. Uh, and we call this stochastic discrete uh, Ricci flow. And, uh, this is just a way of doing it. There could be multiple other ways of doing it. So don't take it necessarily as uh, the algorithm to do graph rewinding, but I think more what is more important is the, the, the overall uh, idea. Now, as a byproduct, we also look at uh, uh, diffusion-based rewiring. So this was a popular paper from uh, the group of uh, Stefan Gunemann at TUM. They call Deagle, so maybe a little bit arrogant uh, title. Uh, Deagle stands for Diffusion Improved Graph Learning. And they, uh, they, they do it by embedding the graph with, using personalized page run, which is a kind of diffusion process, right? So this is a random walk. Uh, with some parameter sigma, and then they uh, connect uh, the, the node embeddings uh, with the nearest neighbors. So what we show here that for given sigma, the new uh, uh, the, the Chigger constant of the rewired graph is uh, controlled by the Chigger constant of the original graph. So Chigger constant, roughly speaking, tells us the clusteredness of the graph. And you can find pathological examples uh, that that would fail Deagle. Uh, this kind of dumbbell, so we have two clicks connected by a bridge, and in this case, uh, the Chigger constant in the limit goes to zero, right? So basically, we don't improve at all in this situation. And this is not surprising. Well, the conclusion is that connect connectivity diffusion, right, or Deagle doesn't necessarily improve graph bottlenecks. And uh, what happens with uh, Deagle is that it tends to create edges within the same community. So if we have a, a graph that is homophilic, in other words, your, uh, the neighbors are similar to you, like is shown here, then this is very good, right? Because you will create uh, even more edges within the same community. So if you have something that looks almost like a click, I will add a few edges to make this uh, uh, look even more like a click. So uh, this will be a very healthy situation because I will uh, get uh, in my graphical network more features that look the same, right? In the homophilic case. So I will average out the noise. And uh, our uh, curvature basically wiring will just maybe make a few surgical connections, so it will not affect uh, much anyway, right? If the situation is heterophilic, then the Deagle will do a disaster. So it will connect us to completely irrelevant nodes. And maybe in this case, the graph neural network will just learn uh, to do node-wise uh, predictions and not use neighbors at all. Uh, 
And the rewiring itself, it, in case of legal, it changes dramatically the structure of the graph. Whereas uh, curvature rewiring, the stochastic Ricci flow is uh, uh, only surgical. So we make just a few changes. And here is, well, it's an old table. If you already replace it, we have some more uh, and better results. But you can see that in case of low homophily, when the, the graphs are heterophilic, we actually significantly perform significantly better. So I'm running out of time. So let me wrap up. I think uh, these are just a few examples of uh, interesting intimate links between graph neural networks, differential geometry, uh, differential equations, and algebraic topology. I didn't talk about algebraic topology, but what we can try to do is uh, to uh, make the diffusion even more interesting and let it account for some geometry of the graph in a loose sense that uh, we invent, we learn. And uh, the initial object to, to uh, describe it is what is called the sheaf. So uh, you can think of message passing on the graph as a kind of uh, uh, form of doing parallel transport. So I have a vector in a node and I move it to another node, right? When you do parallel transport in a plane, you can just move the vector doing nothing to it, right? Because it's flat. When you have a manifold with curvature, the vector will rotate. So this is called parallel transport or a connection. So there is a special mechanism that transforms the vector when you move it from one point to another. So you can do the same thing on the graph. Basically, the shift gives you what is called restriction maps. So these are linear transformations that, uh, uh, that live on the edges and tell you how to transform the vector when it moves from one uh, node to another. And what we show that we can learn these uh, transformations. And in this case, we get uh, a diffusion uh, equation that has slightly more complicated notions of gradients and divergences that uh, 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 have stronger properties uh, in terms of discriminativity and uh, the, the kind of uh, node classification problems that they can solve uh, compared to the uh, to the standard diffusion. So I think bottom line, these are uh, interesting new powerful tools that are previ previously probably less known in graph ML literature. It certainly gives a new perspective and uh, principal takes on some uh, somewhat empirical uh, architectural choices such as positional encoding, graph rewiring, and I think it's just the beginning. I think there are many interesting uh, open questions that still have to be answered. So I think I will stop here. So I will just uh, mention one thing that uh, somehow last year I predicted that uh, we will not need message passing anymore and we'll do something different, but I think uh, practice shows that this prediction didn't uh, leave uh, too long. And in fact, we also wrote a recent blog post. There was a line of works that uses uh, uh, subgraph perturbations uh, in order to still uh, be within the remits of standard message passing, uh, appealing to, to graph uh, reconstruction conjectures, uh, using standard, uh, standard message passing to, to uh, do strictly more expressive architectures than the uh, vice versa element. But this is a talk a different topic and another talk. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael, for this exciting talk and for this uh, different perspective of uh, thinking about graph neural networks. So uh, I think we have a bit of time. So if we have, if there are some questions from the audience, there are already a few in um, the chat. So I would say we can start from the chat and I see already some raising hands, but let's start first with the questions on the chat. Uh, yeah. So I can, yeah, so, I can I, uh, maybe I can read them uh, myself as well. Yeah, I see yeah. Peter has raised hand. Uh, yeah, so age uh, <laughs> uh, weights provide a pretty diverse choice of metric, even within a specific application, comments or insights on smart choices of nature or nature metrics on these approaches, which all depend upon the choice of metric. Well, so I'm not sure that uh, what I understand, uh, uh, basically whether we are talking about metric in the same sense, but um, uh, let me maybe uh, try to answer uh, along the lines that, that, that I said before about uh, the, the, this uh, object uh, that is called a shift. So it is very common to see a situation, let's say, in social networks, right? This has been used in opinion dynamics. So you have users with different opini opinions and maybe similar opinions on different topics, right? So maybe uh, uh, I and my friend, uh, we uh, uh, disagree on politics and agree on science, right? So basically, if I want to make use of his features, I will need to transform them. So that's exactly is taken care of by, by the, these uh, restriction maps of the shift. So what we show in, uh, in it's still unpublished work, but hopefully it will appear on archive soon, uh, 
is uh, that uh, basically the diffusion equation that results from uh, uh, a non-trivial choice of, of a shift uh, it has a much more interesting uh, uh, limit case uh, than, than the standard diffusion. And we actually show that for certain node classification problems, you must have something that is non-trivial, so some non-symmetric non relations, for example, or uh, 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 something that might look like a rotation matrix. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think this is the, maybe in this sense, uh, well, if I understood correctly, uh, the term metric in this context, yeah, so the, the, well, basically we can learn it from the data. We can equip the graph with the right geometry that makes uh, the most sense in a given problem. And geometry again here is understood with this extra stuff that, that we put on the edges. Uh, directed graphs, yeah, so there is a question about how to extend the directed graphs. So uh, there is nothing that, that uh, in principle prevents from uh, doing uh, all these uh, equations uh, for uh, directed graphs. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe some of the, let's say, spectral links uh, might be lost. Um, yeah, but uh, there is nothing inherently uh, problematic with directed graphs. So there is another question in graph rewiring. Are the edges added by curvature given different properties to give the learning process more context? Or would this benefit be outweighed by added complexity? How is the benefit of adding the extra edges versus diluting the information flow taken into uh, account in the process? OK, so what we showed in the paper, uh, don't take it really as a, a working recipe. I think it's more uh, an approach to analyze a problem. So I think this uh, stochastic Ricci flow type evolution is not really a working algorithm. Um, probably what should happen is uh, two coupled equations. One of them uh, evolves the features, so some form of diffusion or maybe some other physical process, and another one evolves the domain. So you can couple uh, something like diffusion equation uh, of the features with diffusion equation of the metric, which is the, the, the Ricci flow. And uh, basically, you rewire the graph. Uh, together with uh, diffusing the features on the graph. And all this is parametric and you turn the knobs for the uh, downstream task. So this is what has been done as well. So in Uri Alon's paper on bottlenecks, for example, they did a few steps of propagation with the input graph and then they just assumed uh, fully connected, so a complete graph. Uh, Deagle does pre-processing. So first you change the graph and then you propagate on the new graph. So basically with this coupled approach, you can have uh, uh, you can have processes that happen at a different uh, time scale. Uh, so maybe we move to the question from Peter. Peter, in case uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. This is a great talk. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, so I guess the question I have is, um, it's I guess it's sort of an overarching question. So. Um, like at the end, you said, uh, you, you know, you can think about message passing as, as parallel transport. Um, what I'm wondering is, like, do you, like, what if GNN message passing in high dimensions isn't best thought of as transport or like diffusion, but rather as um, like symbolic uh, computation on a like distributed computer? Um, and like, you know, if you kind of think about the older, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, things like, um, all the, all the work in like sort of there was work in the early 90s trying to sort of understand the distributed representations in terms of their capacity for symbolic computation um and uh i, I i'm often inspired by that and think, you know think like oh yeah maybe we shouldn't really be thinking about these things just like averaging and sort of like drift and geometry but really like as encoding some kind of discrete thing and like composing it um, i don't know do you have thoughts on that or is, is what you're describing compatible with that yeah, well, so uh, I, I don't have uh, much to say about this, so uh, I don't have much experience. So I think uh, there is uh, very interesting links uh, to category theory. And well, uh, I think yourself and, and, and uh, Peter are working in this direction. So it uh, looks uh, extremely interesting and probably the most general framework that, that you can imagine in this. Uh, uh, to me, the, 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 the geometric and the, the, the PDE uh, uh, style uh, approaches are uh, interesting because, well, we have uh, some understandable physical model of what is happening. So it doesn't need to be diffusion. We are actually, we, we show, for example, uh, other oscillatory systems uh, that, that can be more expressive than, than the diffusion equations. Uh, it is interesting, actually, I think just yesterday there was a paper in Nature about putting uh, uh, physical systems into deep learning architectures. I don't know if you've seen it, so you can 
basically you can integrate a controllable physical system into a neural network. So I don't know, maybe in the future we'll have frying pans that do diffusion with artificial intelligence. Uh, but uh, probably, well, this is of course uh, uh, taking it to, to, to uh, absurd, but uh, probably extremely helpful in biological or physical systems where you can have maybe an uh, in, in vivo or in vitro element uh, together with uh, in silico. Uh, so I, I find a lot of inspiration uh, both ways, right? So uh, basically, uh, putting geometric priors into physical systems, probably AlphaFold is the best example. This is probably uh, one of the, the well, I don't know. I think the, the, there is even internally some argument about uh, how important to the performance was uh, the, the geometric prior of, uh, of equivariance. But uh, uh, this is a non-trivial architecture that, that came up uh, from the from these uh, these ideas of uh, of, uh, of geometric deep learning. Uh, the other uh, way around is also interesting. So the, all the physically inspired uh, learning architectures and basically take a physical system, discretize it, and uh, think of it as a way of parameterizing their solutions. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I, I don't necessarily see a contradiction between these two approaches. So uh, maybe it's uh, whether you, uh, you, you get to a discrete system from a continuous world or starting from a discrete world. I don't know if this, this answers. <laughs> Let's move to the next question from uh, Hamid. Yes, Michael, a uh, very good talk. Thank you. It was very enlightening, uh, particularly for me, because I've just recently actually been looking at this literature on graph neural networks and things. My question is, uh, I, uh, you know, I like to think of, of data in a probabilistic sense. Therefore, you know, when I look at a graph, it's basically a graph of dependencies and such which of course brings us more to a uh, more of a comp you know topological complex rather than just a regular graph and has there been any work that basically uses some of the uh, TDA topological the data analysis uh, in this context uh, yeah. because particularly when you talk about diffusion and things that strikes me a lot as uh, things that are done with the uh, collapses and uh, you know using Dawkins theorem and all that stuff. Yep. Is there any work in that direction? Yeah. So short answer: uh, quite a lot of work, and well, uh, especially recently. So uh, in many different directions. Well, in computer graphics and geometric processing, some form of uh, simplicial complexes, right, or cell complexes meshes. This has been studied for ages, right? And actually, we did our first works on meshes because somehow we have more uh, interesting structure than in graphs. Now, uh, what has been done is learning on both uh, uh, simplicial, right, or maybe these more higher order uh, structures like simplicial or, or cell complexes, where you start with a simplicial complex. So you have, for example, uh, uh, information on flows, right? So where, for example, when you have simplicial complex, you can describe uh, uh, things that you cannot describe with a graph, like, for example, uh, vortices, right? So, and, and things like this. But what is more interesting, and about here I'm uh, obviously shamelessly advertising our own work, is that you can take a graph, so you start with a graph, right, which is uh, probably by far the most popular object, and you can lift it into uh, a cell complex or a simplicial complex by some, some, some operation. So basically you attach cells to some structures in the graph, and you do a message passing that basically higher order topological message passing where you have not only information that is sent from a node to an edge or from an edge to a node, but also to these cells. And we show that this is strictly more powerful than the uh, device for element algorithm. And uh, invariably though, I mean, at, at least in my mind, I, I think if any, uh, ultimately what you're seeking is uh, if you're taking into account dependencies of the data and such, it should it should affect the complexity of your system, right? Of your learning system. Uh, is is that is that something that? Well, so the complexity it, it really depends on the structure of the graph. Uh, um, so it could, of course, uh, because well, you deal with structures that maybe a, a graph can contain a lot of triangles. So what we've seen, for example, with structural positional encoding, okay, so uh, this is essentially a message passing architecture where you attach some features that count, uh, for example, the number of triangles. Triangles actually cannot be detected by standard device for a lemon, 
so it is uh, strictly more powerful than the vice fair lemon. So you absorb uh, this uh, extra uh, pre-computation step that in the worst case can be um, expensive, but in practice, first of all, there are efficient algorithms for counting triangles in, in graphs, and in many practical situations, uh, it's not a big deal, right? But then the, the architecture that, that, that you train, the, the training and the inference complexity uh, will be that of the standard uh, message passing architecture. So it will be just some extra, extra features that you attach to your nodes, that allow you to discriminate between these uh, symmetric regular structures uh, that vice versa lemon uh, fails to recognize. Yeah, so of course there is always a question of uh, higher computational complexity, but in mo most cases, it's not uh, it's not a big deal. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. So uh, I think the next one is Arun. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the wonderful talk. I had actually a question regarding this issue of uh, over squashing or basically having a GNN or a message passing setup retain a lot of layers. Is it that, so going back to the figure that you had in the grand part, so as you, you had shown that the GCN or the simpler ones, actually the performance comes down. But if you see the performance of grand with that stays kind of constant with the number of layers, I was wondering if there is a generally, not just grant, generally there is a merit to keep more and more layers if you can do away with less number of layers. Yeah, this is a very good question. So I don't think that I have a simple answer to this. So a few things. Well, I myself wrote a controversial thing about whether we need deep graph neural networks. So I think Petra actually disagreed with me and DeepMind had a paper where uh, uh, deep graph neural networks were shown successfully. So you can show actually that there are some uh, graph tasks that require a certain number of uh, layers. So you cannot solve them otherwise. And you can also show that there are some graph tasks that no matter how deep you go, uh, cannot be solved, right? So uh, basically have these two extremities. Of course, the, most of the problems lie somewhere in between and we don't actually know uh, uh, about what's, what's the right, uh, what's the right depth. Now about uh, depth, I consider, well, if you forget about the graph, right? And in most modern architectures, you do allow graph rewiring then this question of depth is probably uh, artificial in the sense that uh, I can change the graph and make less layers. So the more interesting question, in my opinion, is that if I have some uh, learning architecture, let's say the same diffusion equation that we considered, and uh, I run it for a certain amount of time on a given graph, right? And I get some solution, right? That, for example, does node classification. Can I compress it to less diffusion time by changing the domain? So is there another graph on which I can run the diffusion that will take less time? And this is a kind of, uh, probably this is a kind of uh, question that uh, has not been asked because graph rewiring changes everything, right? So you cannot anymore analyze it, for example, in terms of the vice fair lemon uh, um, uh, uh, test because the graph has changed, right? So you don't have any more the same input graph. So, so uh, in, in general, I think what is lacking, or at least uh, what I, I lack, and there, there have been some attempts to, to understand that what is more important, features or the graph. I think uh, uh, the group of Roger Battenhofer at ETH uh, had a paper on this. Basically, the graph uh, it has this dual nature. It's both part of the input, and it's also the computational structure. When you decouple the computational graph from the input graph, uh, things change. So it's you cannot anymore uh, 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 compare it to the vice fair element test. So probably it makes sense to talk about the space of solutions that, uh, for example, uh, the diffusion uh, equation gives you, and whether in this space, whether it's rich enough to, to, uh, to represent uh, certain types of functions that you want to compute. Okay. And this is related, I think, pro pro fundamentally to controllability theory. So you want to understand whether you have a, a physical system with some knobs like the diffusion process, uh, whether you can uh, make it uh, at certain point of time to uh, to get to a certain point in the in the uh, in the in the space of right in the state space of the of the problem. And uh, I had one related question again to the diffusivity. So there you mentioned in the slides that you have these uh, results on convergence and stability, and which I assume the diffusivity has to have a certain kind of structure or a functional form to ensure that. Uh, yeah, whereas, so, in, whereas if you go to treating the diffusivity or the A function as a you know attention mechanism, you usually 
if you're if you're viewing it that way you don't really care what attention mechanism you use so i'm just wondering if if the results uh, the more slightly more interesting in that sense theoretical guarantees depend on a certain kind of nonlinearity to be used or would you use it yeah, so it certainly depends on, well, uh, for example, we normalize this nonlinearity. So, so it does depend on, uh, on certain types of nonlinearity. Um, I think stability is important because what we try to do, we try to make bigger steps. So we try to reduce the number of layers. Uh, and uh, in this case, you don't want things so to explode, right? So that's, uh, that's probably the, the, at least one reason why stability is important. Again, it's slightly different from uh, the, the standard situation when you solve uh, uh, a numerical uh, PDE uh, in the sense that you don't care about accuracy. So it's not uh, a solution of, of a problem that, that you're trying to get. You're parameterizing uh, some space of uh, some hypothesis class in this way. So uh, what happens in uh, standard, for example, graph attention networks that you will never choose parameters that will blow up uh, uh, your feature vectors on the graph, right? Because then your loss will be very large and you will basically will penalize in the optimization problem for, for such situations. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Any other question? Maybe, Michael, if there is no other question, I can uh, ask you one. So um, in all these type of architectures that are positional encoding type of architectures, you basically take into account two domains. So you take into account the graph that is evolving and the feature that is evolving in two different ways. So how do you see an extension of these architectures in multiple modalities? Or if you have um, different type of data, for example, lying on the nodes as features? Yeah, what is very, that very good architectures question. Feeder? Yeah, so, um, well, again, not, 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 uh, no short answer. So uh, there are uh, two ways, uh, or at least two ways I, uh, I, can, uh, um, I can think of it. So one of them, well, in the geometric deep learning blueprint, we talked about the symmetry or the, the, the group of the domain, right? So the structure of the domain. Uh, there is a, a parallel thing, which is the structure of the data. So uh, a good analogy would be uh, to think of an uh, RGB image, right? So uh, RGB image, the, the domain is a plane. So there it makes sense to assume, for example, the translation group, or it could be translation and rotation, right? Or maybe translation, rotation, and deflection, so the Euclidean. Uh, Euclidean uh, group of rigid motions, but on the uh, pixels themselves, uh, basically these are this is vector data, and maybe uh, you have a crazy uh, camera sensor that outputs R, G, and B channels in arbitrary order, right? So in this case, uh, the uh, symmetry of the data is permutation, right? Now this is of course a made-up example. Uh, think of another example where you have a collection of objects like images, right? So you have a, a set of images. So the set itself has permutation invariance structure, right? So uh, you, you don't know in which order you uh, put the images in a set, but the images themselves have grid-like structure, so they have translational equivariance. So you can think of this kind of product group where you have uh, a product of permutation of the objects and the translations within the object itself. So that was a paper, I think it won the best paper award, either ACML or in Europe's last year by Hagai Maron. So we used exactly the same idea in uh, our subgraph architecture where we take a graph, we remove from it uh, nodes or edges with some policy, and basically this disambiguates the uh, uh, otherwise ambiguous uh, Weisfer and Lemon um, uh, tests. And then we need to aggregate them. So basically we have a, a set of subgraphs. So basically on each subgraph we have permutation invariants, and between the subgraphs, you also have permutation invariance, right? So it's a product of two permutation group of uh, different side. And there are some nuances, whether you know the correspondence between the graphs or not. So in, if you not, and don't know, it's a special type of product that's called the red product. So uh, 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 interesting, uh, interesting things that, that relate to it. So this kind of structure and structure problems, I think, is very interesting also beyond graphs. So in, uh, in general, in this geometric deep learning blueprint. Yeah, I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it does. Partially, it does. I guess it's uh, it's a big topic for discussion. Thanks. Uh, any last question 
I guess no. So let's thank Michael again. Thanks, Michael, a lot for this exciting talk. And thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, yeah, see you again.